just a very quiet epiphany moment when this journey has begun to really make sense. I mean, this stila, this single piece of rock, holds many of the elements that I've seen on my journey up until now, but here configured in a way that gives them a kind of sense, gives them a continuous historical narrative, which I suppose is the history of Ethiopia. The features on these stelae, marking the ancient burial places of Ethiopian emperors 2,000 years ago, have been consciously echoed down the years by the emperors that followed them. What I'm seeing at Aksum are continuous traditions taking the story of the Ethiopian kingdom back to the beginning of Christianity. But I still want to find evidence that the kingdom might go back even further, to the days of Solomon and Sheba. Yergalem has one more ancient artifact to show me. Wow, what's this? Here we have uh, a memorial stone inscription which was written in the beginning of the 4th century by King Ezana, wow. the first Christian king of Aksumite kingdom. So what, what, what's inscribed on it? The message of the inscription is more about his military victories and more about his political power. It's a proclamation, a kind of tourist information sign, telling visitors to Aksum about the might of the emperor. And it's multilingual. The inscriptions in the local Geir's language, still used in church traditions. It's in the international language of the day, ancient Greek, and it's in a language called Sabaean. Sabaean was spoken only for a brief time, and only in this part of Africa and southern Arabia. Historians think it died out around the 8th century, but it first appeared around 1000 BC. It's the language of Saba, the part of Yemen where the Queen of Sheba is said to have come from. This stone is from the 4th century AD, 1400 years after the Queen of Sheba is supposed to have reigned. It's not the Ark of the Covenant, but it does point me deeper into the past in my search for the kingdom's origins. It's thought that the kingdom of Aksum was a continuation of a civilization which had existed nearby. That's where I'm headed now. Just 20 miles away is a town of Yeha. It could be the Old Testament world I've been looking for. In this ancient town is a pre-Christian temple. There were worshippers here when the Old Testament prophets were writing. Over here, there would have been an altar. And it's quite a deep well beneath the altar because there would have been ritual sacrifice here. This would have been a place in which the blood would have been allowed to drain. An important part of Old Testament Judaism was making offerings in the form of slaughtered sheep and goats. And this may well have been a bath where people would have come to cleanse themselves. I mean, this building suggests all sorts of things. Not much is known about the people who built this temple, but archaeologists believe this is the oldest surviving building in Ethiopia. And it predates everything that we've seen up until now. And the quality of this brickwork, it just belies the fact that this building is 500 BC. That means it's older than the Parthenon in Greece and centuries older than Rome's Colosseum. It echoes the Judaism of the Old Testament, the faith that the Ethiopian Orthodox Church claims was adopted here a thousand years before Christ. And it echoes what the Patriarch told me at the start of my journey. So we accepted Judaism, and then we accepted Christianity. Now it is 3,000 years old altogether. But the most exciting thing about this temple is a collection of artefacts found inside it. 
They're now kept nearby in this small Christian church. And I think they might offer a final clue about Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, and the ancient kingdom of Ethiopia. Please, good day. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't know it would be like this. There are crosses and scriptures spanning many years of Christianity. Thank you. And there's an incense burner which doesn't belong in any church. It's been carved with the pre-Christian symbol of the crescent moon and the sun. Archaeologists think it dates from the 5th century BC. And from the same era as the burner are these stones, inscribed in the language of the Queen of Sheba, Sabean. These are almost certainly objects from the time of the Old Testament, and they show an ancient link between Ethiopia and Saba, the home of the Queen of Sheba. This takes us back to, well, to the very beginning. I mean, a lot of people talked about the Queen of Sheba, and here you're showing me a stone inscription which may well mean that all of that is true. It's pre-Christian evidence of the Queen of Sheba's language in the heart of ancient Ethiopia. It means it's just possible that the legend of her son founding Ethiopia's kingdom is based in fact. I wanted to find out whether there was any truth in the legend of Ethiopia's kingdom being founded by the son of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. In Ethiopia, separating legend from fact is difficult. The stones in the church, inscribed with the Sabaean characters, are estimated to be two and a half thousand years old. Not quite the three thousand years the church claims for its connection to the Old Testament, but not far off. And whilst there might not be proof of a blood connection to Solomon, there is a striking cultural connection to the world of the Old Testament. It's also striking that faith in this legend has lasted for centuries, closely tied to the unique traditions of the Ethiopian church. I think it's endured because of Ethiopia's determination to resist the influence of outsiders and to remain independent. Ethiopia's emperors may have died out, but the kingdom in many senses still survives, in the language, in the people, in the history, in the traditions. It's an extraordinary history, a proud history, one that deserves to be better known. The Lost Kingdoms of Africa continues next Tuesday at 9.